In my deepest hope, it would be that the talk by Christine and Jared and mine would all be part of a choir, and that we would be a co cooperative Shakespeare, or perhaps a cooperative Hegel, at least, because it's, it's the same talk. Um, but I want to start with the sociology of art. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, dear friends, what we are doing today is constituting an art world. The sociologists have studied how you constitute an art world. You gather a corpus of objects, then you call in the intellectuals, and you get them talking about it and producing brilliant sentences. I'm very happy to be enlisted in this cause. Now, the standard literary genre on such occasions as this has long been the manifesto. Uh, which can serve both as an aesthetic program and as an ad copy for the art world. I hope you'll agree with me that Promethean Rebellion is rather tired and also a poor fit. I want to try something besides a manifesto. In modernity, as we've just heard, art and religion have this complicated relationship, which I'm not going to go into. But the British Romantics, inspired by the most compelling character of John Milton's Paradise Lost, made Satan, or an admiration of Satan, into an article of aesthetic faith. And a preference for the energies of hell over the order of heaven has long been the ideology of the avant-garde from before Mormonism even existed. Politically, the Romantics were revolutionaries, at least when they were young. And the manifesto genre carries with it a call for uninhibited overthrow of power and of taboos. The Romantics also had the unfortunate habit of dying young, reinforcing their idea that death is the mother of beauty. The specter of morbidity has stopped artistic practice since, from Shelley, Keats, and Byron, to Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, and Jean-Michel Basquiat. Though many, notably our keynote speaker, Terrell Gibbons, has, have compellingly shown affinities between Romanticism and Mormonism, here, at least, I think it breaks down. Dying young? How is that a Mormon attitude? How can we even think about celebrating that amid a culture that produces such youthful octogenarians as the Bushmans? <laughs> One of the many striking things about Spencer W. Kimball's call 50 years ago is how healthy-minded and sunny it is. It is thoroughly free of the long, smoldering suspicion that art is fueled by transgression. In a long list of artists who we've seen, whose personal lives might have given an apostle plenty to blanch at, it's quite remarkable that he only singles out poor Rembrandt for someone whose morals might have been slightly suspicious. I mean, President Kimball says, look, I mean, look what great artists did without the benefits of the restored gospel. Imagine what we could do with it. It is a striking contrast, I should add, to Boyd K. Packer's much darker talk a decade later which posed much more starkly a face-off of art and religion, the, the competition or succession anxiety that, that Jared was talking about. Where Kimball saw cooperation, Packer saw potential competition. My heart is with Kimball, but Packer was within his rights to diagnose the risks, as I, will, as I will show. Let's start with some basic terms. The scriptural source for the pairing of the two terms of my title is a revelation to Joseph Smith in 1832. For Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. This echoes Isaiah about the city of Jerusalem putting on her beautiful garments. Note the careful phrasing and punctuation, alerting us that beauty and holiness might not be the same thing. Indeed not. Holiness is not always beautiful. Similar language is used thrice elsewhere in the Doctrine and Covenants, saying that the church is, quote, to arise clear as the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible as an army with banners. Terrible, of course, meaning fearsome, not lousy. Uh, Isaiah makes a point of saying, indeed, that the Messiah will have no beauty. The holy can be ugly or repulsive, haunted or enchanted, but it is always riveting. Rudolf Otto's classic definition of the holy, published exactly one century ago, underscored its otherness, the tremendous mystery of a presence beyond our ken. At the same time, Emil Durkheim traced the concept of the sacred to the practice of animal sacrifice and argued that the sacred had a double face. It is both transcendent and accursed, the sweet-smelling savor of the smoke 
and the corpse of the sacrificial victim. Indeed, an etymological hint is found in the word blessed or blessed, which normally means happy or rewarded, but comes from the French word meaning being uh, wounded, to be wounded. Blessing can be anointing or a flow of blood. Holiness is always binding and compelling, but it is not always pretty. Art is obviously not always holy, and many artists have fruitly, sorry, many artists have fruitfully mined the profundity of profanity with great insight and gusto. But it is also not necessarily beautiful. It might be lovely, a canonical term for us, Article of Faith number 13, but art can also be obnoxious, fun, sly, spellbinding, disturbing, tranquilizing, perplexing, uplifting. To just stick with some people from the neighborhood in the past five decades, think of uh, Marcel Duchamp, John Cage, Jeff Koons, Andy Warhol, Barbara Kruger, Cindy Sherman, Willem de Koning, um, Diana Arbus, or indeed Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, not all that is beautiful is art either. The sky, the earth, the sea, trees, clouds, stars, faces, bodies, being itself can be beautiful, although these things can also be plain or dull or overwhelming. Indeed, the history of life on earth is both constant and catastrophic, lovely and brutal, and as indeed as we work through the sixth wave of, of extinctions with all of our gorgeous ants and gnarly black mold. My efforts at definition thus have led us into a maze, which is maybe a little bit too much for the mid-afternoon sleeping slump that we're all in, and would make a very complicated Venn diagram from which I will spare you. The point is that art is not safe, and there is no reason to think that Mormon arts should want to be safe. Mormonism is the theology of risk, danger, and choice. It was Lucifer's plan, not Milton's Lucifer, but the Lucifer's plan was the one of the safety and the guarantees. Now, if this talk were a manifesto, I'd call for Mormon artists to shake off the culture's shackles and prohibitions and move boldly forward, fearlessly questioning, probing where it hurts, and defying the dark fathers of authority. But what if the risks were signs of opportunities? What if our complicated taboos were inspiration and not just hindrance for art? What if the restrictions on expression were an indirect tribute to and source of its power? What would a visual culture be, for instance, that took distance from two of the central resources of Western painting, the crucifixion and the nude? If the stakes are life and death, body and soul, belonging and leaving, violence and sex, at least art matters, and matters profoundly. What if the winning strategy were to revere the prohibitions, to cultivate the edge spaces instead of bulldozing them, in short, to make the desert of Mormon contraries blossom like a rose? We need a higher fidelity to our tradition, not a transcendence of it. Bans and prohibitions can produce dejection and debility, but they can also be gargantuanly fruitful. Indeed, cherubim and a flaming sword made the human race possible by denying the return to Eden. Nothing provokes creativity more than having a law to break. Indeed, no one hates censorship more than I do, the Spanish surrealist uh, filmmaker Luis Buñuel supposedly said but nobody can say how much I owe to it. <laughs> I think we should be grateful for angels and demons to wrestle with. Perhaps the religious artist has an unfair advantage over the secular. Much of our utilitarian American civilization is utterly indifferent to art, and busy bee Mormon culture has often postponed art for the never arriving hour after all the home teaching, gardening, and family history research are done. But in religious settings, the high stakes of art can appear. Take two novels with unintentionally similar names. By Orhan Pamuk, my name is Red, and by Chaim Hotok, my name is Asher Lev. Both concern the tortured place 
of art in corners of religious traditions, Islam and Judaism, where you make images at the peril of your soul and at the risk of offending God and your community. For a Mormon, too, art poses genuine risks, loss of faith, transgression, depiction beyond the bounds the Lord has set. And it's, I mean, we all know that you know, there's a lot more worry about the dangers of art than there is about business, despite the much more robust scriptural tradition warning us about the latter. Well, we can, we all know why. <laughs> uh, let me add that I'm encouraging a grown-up fostering of confrontation with the taboos, an effort to draw fruits from the tension. The Mormon quest for refinement to bring up uh, a good Bushman theme again makes it easy to tweak sensitivities. In a culture in which a sleeveless dress or a non-white shirt is notable, the threshold of scandal is remarkably low. The, the slightest bit of raucousness can get a rise. But such great sensitivity can also be seen as an exquisite kind of aesthetic attunement, as a resource. Indeed, one curious fact about Mormon arts, especially literature by men, is the inescapable presence of the scatological. You find it in the novels of Levi Peterson, Brady Udall, Orson Scott Carty, even in different ways, to say nothing of the Book of Mormon musical, whatever we want to do with that. Um, if beauty stems from embodiment, then beauty will always be uncanny, since the bodies, fluids, gases, and solids are connected to infrastructures of all kinds. A religion that puts the body at the heart of time and eternity should appreciate the amuncteries, as Peterson calls them, but such appreciation need not drift, this is my editorial comment, into puerile zones so quickly. I'm not sure where rat vomit fits on this, uh, <laughs> but anyway. You know, and while I'm at it, it, it is note the remarkable Mormon penchant for violence in Mormon literature. Again, in Card and Udall, even more so in, in, in Brian Evanson or Neil Rebute. Indeed, Mormonism is founded on a book framed by civilization ending violence. But what if life were the mother of beauty? Is there a cosmology or metaphysics within Mormonism that is a warrant for an expansive conception of the arts? I think there is and that it lies in the notion of eternal increase. Let me explain. We know the meaning of things belatedly. Joe N. Lai famously was once asked about what he thought about the French Revolution and said, too, too early to say. Uh, things do not yet exist that however, once, that however once they exist will seem to be a necessary and eternal part of the, of the universe. Traditional philosophy assigned to God alone the power to make the necessary. We humans, in fact, have that power twofold, in art and nature, in work and biology, in short, in our ability to make creative pro products and the ability to give birth to children. We can bring things into the world that are both entirely new and entirely necessary. Once upon a time, Mahler's first symphony, to take one example, didn't exist. And all human history before 1890 seems to have just done seems to have died just fine without it. But now that it exists, I for one would find the universe in some sense profoundly altered for the worst, if it were somehow to vanish. The same holds for W.W. Felt's hymn lyrics or paintings by Minerva Tiger, to take um, a more local example. I live fine for the first chunk of my life without my children, but now that they are born, I cannot imagine the world without them. They didn't always exist on Earth, and yet I cannot help but feel they are an absolutely essential part of the fabric of things. The archive of art and the human family, family share the character of being growing totalities. It's like ice cream, there's always room for more. The new item makes you realize that you were missing something you never knew before. Or again in Mormon parlance, we can use the term added upon. We could write a very long history of the ways that metaphors of birth and art have intertwined. An artwork is a revelation of a truth, just as a newborn child alters the world forever. Romantic Promethean fire stealing is not helpful, not only because it makes rebellion or pathology the price of authenticity, but because it is too lonely with the artist of solo genius. I really did write this before Janet, but anyway. Um, which is also to say it's too masculinist. 
One meaning of Mormonism is this massive project of kinship, of making the whole world kin through baptismal adoption, living or dead, and of making kin directly through procreation. There are arts, many kinds, <laughs> traditionally assigned to women, midwifery, weaving, cooking, nursing, caring, that are left out of this narrative. There are midwing arts, oratory, that might be a great Mormon art, canning, gardening, congregational singing, road shows. My point is not to reinforce a stale gender division of labor. Of course women make art, and of course men make babies. But to celebrate the work of soul making as one of the fine arts. Mormonism, I wrote this too before, <laughs> Mormonism, Mormonism is immaterial art, social art, one big work of performance art, of bringing the universe into being, of participating in God's work and glory. My colleague Waichi Divan calls such work infrastructure art. So Mormonism is a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, as Wagner, who President Kimball seems to have liked, would have said, a total work of art. The building of Zion and the making of, pe of, a, of a people is itself a work of art. And we shouldn't miss one of the most obvious facts about Mormonism since it emerged from its late 19th century cocoon. Mormons excel in beauty in their persons. Look around this room. Beauty, evolutionarily considered, is sexual attraction, as Darwin taught us, but it's also a kind of luxuriance in life itself, a pleasure taken in just being alive. The fierce way we cling to life is one of the origins of the aesthetic. I stunomai, ancient Greek. I perceive, I feel, is the origin of our term um, aesthetic. Feeling is first, as E. E. Cummings and Charles Sanders Peirce put it. Here is the philosophical theology we need to ground Mormon arts. The universe grows by play. There is something both excessive and indispensable about creation. In a celestial world, would we need lawyers or doctors, entrepreneurs or plumbers? Maybe. Wait, who knows? Uh, but here's the primary of the, uh, the primacy of the aesthetic. It is the one mode of being that is guaranteed not to lose its eternal relevance. It's a zone of activity that remains open once health and wealth are taken care of. There's a lot of music to compose, poetry to write, gardens to cultivate, people to know. Artists are guaranteed eternal employment, not so much doctors, lawyers, politicians. Um, indeed, in Mormon theology, there's a way of seeing creation itself, nature, the universe, as God's artwork. In God, art and nature are one. So as, as American philosopher Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, who I mentioned, um, put it, meaning belongs to the future. The universe comes into being dynamically. Its significance is profoundly open-ended. There are real risks and dangers. Peirce called this evolutionary love, the idea of a growing per perfection, a totality that is complete but can always change and grow. Theologically, Mormonism discovers this synthesis of perfection and progression, and giving an, thereby also gives an account of love and the art and a family. To adapt the last line of George Eliot's great novel, Middlemarch, the growing good of the cosmos is dependent on unhistoric acts, or maybe unhistoric arts. Now, I also recognize the danger, by the way, that such an expansive vision of the arts might end up risking engulfing or delegitimizing the arts as, uh, as traditionally see as plastic audiovisual um, creative forms. But again, once an innovation, a new work of art, or a new human being is, is present, we cannot help but forget that it did not always exist. In Mormon thought, the capacity to contribute to creation is generously parceled out to many beings. It is not solely a divine monopoly. The ability to make things that are cosmically necessary is the province of all creatures endowed with intelligence, with the powers of creation. We are on the brink. Every act is a creative one that puts at stake the future of everything. We are not just downloading the heavenly script, but making necessary things that exist from this point on. And thus, we rearrange the way that things have always been. 
This awesome power includes humans and the atonement, which is the ongoing rewriting of the past. That a human deed can be necessary in the strictest philosophical sense is one argument for the divine potentials or shareholding of human beings, which are uh, arguments distinctive to Mormon theology. It is also an endorsement of our inherent artfulness and a, and a description of our terrible freedom. Humans are responsible for everything. Even God's work and glory depend upon our choices. The cosmos stands in need of us, awaiting on our arts and acts to bring about its growing perfection. This is the beautiful and terrifying cosmology that should inspire the Mormon arts. Thank you very much.